Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 10th of November and a lot of updates this week, especially around AKS because it was KubeCon, so they announced a whole bunch of different things. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update. A new video is this week, so I created a higher level video about adopting Azure. Really the key considerations in terms of planning, in terms of getting the right governance in place, skilling, and then thinking about the actual applications. And then I created a video just going over the brand new type of credential applied skills. These are completely free. It's all lab based. It's in real Azure or whatever the technology is. And it gives you some nice hands on guided tasks to perform and then you get a nice credential that demonstrates you have that very focused skill. On to what's new. So on the compute side, there are some new metrics available. So for all of the disks, there's now a latency metrics. This is monitoring in milliseconds, the average latency for IOs, but also now for temp disks, you get the IOPS throughput and queue depth that are attached to your Azure virtual machines. For Azure Red Hat OpenShift, there were a few updates. So OpenShift 4.12 now has a 14 month life cycle. The cluster size has grown to 120 nodes. It was 62 nodes, so now I can have up to 120. And I can also now use policy to apply tags to the OpenShift resources. And then the AKS updates. So 1.28 has gone GA. This obviously means that the 1.25 will start to go into that deprecation path. The CADA add-on has gone GA. So that's the event-driven autoscaler. So that gives me better ability to create, remove pods based on different factors. Configurable drain timeouts have gone GA. So if the default 30 minute, maybe as part of upgrade operations, things are taking longer, I can now increase that drain timeout, for example, to, uh, I think it's up to 24 hours is the maximum drain time I can configure. I'm also now with 1.28 and above, I'm gonna get more memory available for my workloads. So what they've done is, I think it's about 20% is the most memory you may see. Ordinarily, uh, Kubernetes has to be fairly aggressive in the reservations it makes on the nodes to make sure it has enough memory for its core components. What's happened is in 128 and above, there are now different ways to ensure priority for those core components, which means it can relax some of those fairly aggressive reservations it had in the past. So basically, hey, more memory available for my pods. Application routing add-on has gone GA. So this is actually being powered by the Ingress Nginx project. It provides a very simple way if I have a web-based application to enable it to be exposed so it can be connected to either the Ingress controller, uh, the DNS and the certificates. Behind the scenes, it's using Key Vault for the certificates, it's using Azure DNS, and then that managed Ingress Nginx project instance but very easy now to get that uh, ingress controller up and running. And then Carpenter for AKS provider has gone GA. So Carpenter actually started out as an AWS project, which is now open sourced. And think of it as a replacement for the cluster autoscaler, i.e. <clears throat> adding and removing actual nodes. The cluster autoscaler that's built in is great for adding nodes. It's not so great at bringing them back. So what the Carpenter add-on by this provider, it's a lot better at those things. So it watches for pods that the scheduler has marked as unschedulable. I can take them back. It evaluates the various scheduling constraints. It provisions the nodes if it needs to. It will then schedule the pods, but it will also then remove the nodes if they're no longer needed. So it's gonna give me a lot better optimization of the resources that exist and i.e. what I'm paying for. Dual stack for CNI overlay is in preview. So this means it's adding IPv6 support. And obviously the CNI overlay, that is the go forward path that's really being recommended now for my AKS workloads. 
it has a different IP space than that of the underlying nodes, but it doesn't have all of the problems and overhead that we had with KubeNet. So now uh, IPv6 as well was in preview. The Istio-based service mesh, mesh has got some enhancements. So the whole point of Istio, Istio is it helps with those distributed or microservice-based architectures. It's an add-on service mess which adds a sidecar, i.e. another pod, a container that runs within the main container. And that adds these pieces of functionality. Now this could be load balancing, monitoring, uh, traffic splitting, traffic controls, authentication. But now I can do things like manually doing minor updates before they would happen automatically. That made it harder for me to roll out the changes to test it and make sure it's good before it goes and hits the production workload. Well, now I can manually do those minor upgrades. I can bring my own certificate authority and it supports egress gateways, which would be exit points from the mesh. Now it has image integrity support in preview as well. Basically, I can create a policy that says the only images that can run on the nodes have to be signed. So it helps me avoid having maybe suspect images or those that aren't a trusted entity. So they, they have to be signed. And this is a pretty big one. Artifact streaming has gone into preview. So this used to be known as teleport, I think. And it really boils down to the fact, it's actually maybe easier to show, that if you think of a, a regular image, well, an image isn't actually just a single thing. An image is always made up of layers. So there might be, hey, there's some unique bits. But then there's a whole bits of that, those layers that might be common to another image. So I've got a different image over here, which then has a whole bit of common stuff. Now, ordinarily, when I fetch the image, it would go and pull down all of the layers, even though these ones here are actually common. So what that cache does is it creates a shared cache of the common layers. So now, if I have to do a pull, for example, of this image, well, it only has to pull those parts because these bits are already there because there's a huge amount of overlap between many images. Well, that's gonna be much, much faster. So it means, hey, as I create those new pods and I have to pull down the image, this pull is gonna be much quicker because it's not having to go and pull all of that from, for example, the ACR instance. So it's gonna speed up that whole process. So that's really the big deal um, with that feature. So that is now in preview. I think it's only Linux based today. Uh, I suspect that will expand over time. And then a new VM series. So the NGADS VM SKU. And if we quickly look, this is all about cloud gaming. And what we can see here is it's based on the AMD Radeon uh, V620 GPUs and the AMD Epic Milan CPUs. And what I can do here is I can either get a quarter, a half, or a whole GPU. And obviously that impacts also the, the overall size, the amount of memory, the amount of vCPU. But that is now available in GA. Moving on, on the networking side, so the regional WAF now has rate limiting in GA. Now I've talked about this before when it was in preview, but basically what this lets me do is for the regional WAF, I, it's connected to an app gateway, which is the regional uh, layer seven gateway. It enables me to detect and then block abnormally high levels of traffic. Now I can specify what that grouping is. It's based on a sliding window and that could be grouped by the source IP it can be grouped by the geolocation, or it can have no grouping, i.e. it's everything. And whatever I'm grouping it by is the same set that would then be impacted by the throttling. So I have a lot of control on how I wanna do the grouping and then how that throttling would be applied. And then the app gateway public private list and a common pool is GA. And again, we've talked about this before. It just means now I can have a single app gateway serving both public and internal, and I don't have to use a different pool. So 
so I don't have to use non-regular ports, I don't have to do some um, strange configuration, I can use the same port on both a public and private listener. And then the app gateway now has IPv6 support in preview. So again, it's dual stack, so I could support both IPv4 and IPv6 connections coming in um, from the various clients. On the storage side, so the Elastic SAN has some updates in preview. Remember, Elastic SAN is about providing a block level iSCSI target to the various workloads. This now includes the Azure VMware solutions. So this is really big that it allows the storage requirements of AVS to scale differently from my actual AVS nodes. It supports customer managed keys for the encryption as well. And we've seen this before with the Azure Container Storage Solution that also can use Elastic SAN. Speaking of which, the Azure Container Storage Solution is now more integrated with AKS. As part of the deploy and use of AKS cluster creation, I can now hook into the Elastic SAN. And the whole point of the Azure Container Storage is it was built for AKS. Other technologies like managed disks, um, ANF, ephemeral, they just existed for infrastructure solutions. This is specifically designed for Kubernetes, which enables it to resize faster, um, handle better failover if a pod moves between different nodes, etc. So now you have multi-zone storage pools, so better resiliency. It can use server-side encryption with customer managed keys. I can dynamically resize the volume and I can use snapshot and cloning. Also, Azure NetApp files can now be used with the Azure VMware solution. So again, a different option for having separate storage capacity from that of the actual native Azure VMware solution nodes is available in the Gov regions. And that has now gone GA. On the database side, so Azure SQL Database Elastic Jobs had a fairly huge update. The whole point of Elastic Jobs is it lets me execute T-SQL queries and maintenance tasks against one or more Azure SQL databases, which can be defined on a schedule, and I can have retry logic in there as well. So this is really, really useful is if I need to either run tasks on a schedule and or I need to run those tasks in a whole group of SQL databases. So now this lets me integrate with Microsoft Entra ID, i.e. formerly Azure AD um, for the authentication. It can use private links to now connect to the databases. So private link, remember, is an IP from my network to securely connect to the database. I can set up Azure alerting and then the regular action groups to let me know when uh, a job has, for example, completed or there was some issue with the execution. I can support up to 800 targets, and I can now get enhanced tracking of the various jobs through the Azure portal. So a whole bunch of enhancements to those elastic jobs. And then on the miscellaneous side, so Azure Monitor Logs Archive was a new tier that was introduced for, hey, I need to keep the contents of my Log Analytics workspace, but I don't wanna pay as much money, and I don't need the ability to run the KQL directly against it. So now I can store it in that archive for up to 12 years. But remember, if I actually want to then run KQL against it, I have to bring it back into another tier. That's using a restore job, or I can run a search job against it to get specific data to bring it into a regular table that I can then run those queries against. Windows 365 has two new large SKUs. So there's a 16 uh, virtual CPU with 64 gigabytes of RAM with either 512 gigabytes of storage or one terabyte of storage. They also added some new gallery images around Windows 11 preview with uh, 365 apps and OS optimizations, the 23H2 version of those. And then Microsoft are rolling out Microsoft Managed Conditional Access Policies. There's three of these. Now you may have remember in the past, they introduced that concept of security defaults. That was applied even for the free SKU. 
it enforced MFA in certain scenarios and it really helped um, customers uptick using MFA, which gives you a lot better protection. Now they're introducing Microsoft Managed Conditional Access policies, for example, if I'm actually using Conditional Access, to once again try and drive those better behaviors. Now, I think you have 90 days that they're gonna show up for before they even take effect. They're gonna show up in an audit mode, but it's gonna require MFA for the admin portals. It's gonna require MFA for per user MFA users, and it's gonna require MFA for a high risk sign-in. So that obviously only applies if you have identity protection, which is part of the P2 SKU. So those will be rolling out automatically. You'll see them in the portal differently. It will show as Microsoft managed. So you can absolutely go in and say, no, no, I don't want those. I could disable it. I could tweak it if I wanted to. But those are rolling out. So go and check the entry portal. Again, it's going to start in audit mode. So it won't have any impact. You can go and make changes if you want to. And... Chaos Studio experiments now support customer managed key for encrypting the experiment in preview. Remember, Chaos Studio is fantastic for introducing faults to help you simulate, hey, if there was a real world problem, I can see, well, how well does my architecture actually respond? And that was it. So quite a lot of updates this week. As always, I hope that was useful. Till next video, take care.